All right, here are solutions for the first problem on the final exam for uh, Math 111, Fall 16. Uh, so this first problem is a bunch of true-false statements. So I'm just gonna, you, all you have to do is say whether they're true or false, but I'm gonna give a little bit of a justification. So the first one says a degree seven polynomial must have at least seven real roots. That is a false statement. And if you really wanted to, you could make it true by making this at most, if you wanted to. Um, a degree seven polynomial the sum of the multiplicities of its roots must be equal to exactly seven. Um, but those roots could be real roots. They could be complex roots. So you don't necessarily know that it has seven roots and it cannot have more than seven roots. Um, this is definitely a false statement. Second one, a degree five polynomial could have exactly three complex roots. That is also false. Um, but for a different reason than why this is false, so yeah, the sum of the multiplicities of the roots has to be equal to five, that's true. However, complex roots always come in conjugate pairs. Um, so we must have an even number of complex roots. Complex roots come in conjugate pairs. Conjugate pairs. So what that means is if two plus three i, for example, is a complex root, then two minus three i must also be a root. There's no way I could have three. I could have two, I could have four. Um, I couldn't have six because I can't have more than the degree of the polynomial. At any rate, that's a false statement. Uh, part C here is if f is an odd function and f of two equals three, then it must be true that f of negative two equals negative three. That's actually true. Um, the definition of an odd function is that uh, the height of the negative of an x value, well, sure, is equal to the negative of the height of an x value. So what I'm saying here is if I take any input that I want, um, two for example, then its output must be the opposite of the output that I get when I put negative two into the function. So when I put two into the function, I get three coming out. Um, this three must be the opposite of the output that I get, negative three, when I put the negative of two into the function. This is a true statement. Uh, D says if g is an odd function and g of 2 equals 3, then it must be true that g of 3 equals 2. No, that's false. I don't know. Uh, I guess that's just to kind of mess with people. I don't know. This switching the input and the output, that has nothing to do with the function being odd. Um, I don't know where the hell that comes from or why someone would think that was true. It's certainly false. Um, and the reason it's false is this is our definition for an odd function, and that has nothing to do with that. Uh, I don't know. Well, I'm not even going to come up with an example. I'm just going to say false. E, I thought this was a particularly hard question. This is supposed to be testing your knowledge of function transformations. So what's going on here is f of two equals three. So the point two, three is on the graph of f. The x value is two, the y value is three. And what I'm told is there's some other function, g of x, and g of x is similar to f of x, it's just got these transformations going on. There's this negative here, this two here, and this plus one here. What we have to think, figure out is what each of those things does to this point uh, and then we can figure out where this point ends up, and that'll give us a point that is on the graph of g of x. And the question is, is that point equal to 1, negative 2, this point right here? Well, let's see. I have three function transformations going on here. This one is a vertical transformation, and this one is a vertical transformation. And when I'm talking about vertical transformations, I do the multiplication before I do addition, so i got to apply this one before I apply this one. So if I apply v1 to this point, it's affecting the y-coordinate. Um, it's taking the y-coordinate and multiplying it by negative 1. So this point would go to 2, negative 3 if I applied v1. Um, and then if I applied v2, what that's going to do is it's going to add 1 to all of the y-coordinates. So this y-coordinate at negative 3 is going to go up by 1, so now it's at negative 2. So if I apply v2, I get to here. Um, but I'm still not done because I have one more transformation in here. Maybe I can call it h1. On uh, this 2 right here, this divides all of the x-coordinates by 2. Uh, so maybe just so I can follow this a little bit better, I'll put it off to the side here, h1. And I'll draw an arrow kind of pointing at that 2. And that's going to divide all the x-coordinates by 2. So instead of this being 2, negative 2, it's going to be 1, at negative 2. And sure enough, that's this point over here. So what's going on is if I apply these function transformations, this point right here turns into this point right here. So if this point is on the graph of f, and g is just defined as these function transformations, then this point must be on the graph. This is a true statement. f, in a rational function, 
If the degree of the numerator is the same as the degree of the denominator, then the function must have a horizontal asymptote. That's a true statement. Uh, when you're talking about horizontal asymptotes, you're describing n behavior. And there's three different options for n behavior. If the degree of the top, the numerator, is greater than the degree of the denominator, if the degree of the top equals the degree of the bottom, or if the degree of the top is less than the degree of the bottom. Um, and depending on which of these cases are you're in, you have different end behavior. If the degree of the top is greater than the degree of the bottom, then you kind of divide the leading coefficients and you treat it like a polynomial. Um, so we'll have end behavior, but I'll be going off towards infinity or negative infinity when I go to the left or the right of my graph. So I'll have no horizontal asymptote. Um, if the degree of the top equals the degree of the bottom, then I get a horizontal asymptote at y equals quotient of leading coefficients. I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, the quotient of the leading coefficients is talking about the number that is out in front of the term with the largest degree up in the numerator. So suppose that's like a three. And then the number that's out in front of the term of the largest degree in the denominator, maybe that's a two. I would take that three divided by that two and get three halves, and that's where my horizontal asymptote would be. If the degree of the top is less than the degree of the bottom, then I always get a horizontal asymptote at, and instead of by y equaling the quotient of the leading coefficient, it's always at y equals zero. So I have three different cases and three different things can happen. In this specific case, I'm talking about the middle one. If the degree of the numerator is the same as the degree of the denominator, then I will have a horizontal asymptote. Sure, that's true. I could even be more specific. I could say where the horizontal asymptote will be. But for the sake of this problem, that's a true statement. G says, in a rational function, I think this is very similar to this one. If the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, so now we're talking about this bottom case here, then the function must have a horizontal asymptote. That's true also. Um, and I can also be more specific. It'll be at y equals zero. It's this third case from above here. That's definitely a true statement. The only time you don't have a horizontal asymptote is if the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator, this first of the three cases up here. H, it is not possible for a given rational function to have both horizontal and vertical asymptotes. That is a very false statement. Um, it is possible. And that's basically because vertical and horizontal asymptotes are unrelated. These guys, vertical and horizontal asymptotes, these are independent of each other. They have similar names, but that's kind of where your similarities end. Horizontal asymptotes just describe the end behavior of their polynomial. And vertical asymptotes talk about points that are undefined, that don't have a height, um, and the graph goes off towards infinity at those points. But really, these have nothing to do with these, and there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't have both in the same rational function. In fact, you probably will more often. Than, well, okay. If I'm going to test you on this, I want you to show me your knowledge of these things. I'm going to make a problem that has both of them, most likely. Anyways, that's a false statement. Um, then you end up with some dumb true false statement. What do we got here? This was uh, talking about the warriors, whatever. You put true, false, it doesn't matter. True slash false, I don't care. Um, this is because the points don't add up. I think this is worth 25 points. So if I make them each of the true false statements worth three, then there's a point left over. And I could just give everybody the points. I don't know why I write some dumb statement at the end. Um, but do whatever the hell you want with that. Um, that's the end of the first problem.